It's time for another Two Women Talking. It is I, Leanna, Tomboy, and Song W. Erickson, Girly Girl, author of Calidus Chronicles, Volume 1, available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And today, we're staying in the real world. Well, as much as possible on this topic. <laughs> we're going to talk about the fractures in feminism. And oh, this, boy. Yeah, this was inspired by a couple of conversations, one of which Song and I were having about intersectionality. And, you know, I said to Song, the thing about intersectionality, it has become literally the opposite of where it started. And, you know, for people who don't know, intersectionality is supposed to be the concept that the various pieces that make up a person intersect in such complicated ways, you cannot separate them. So you cannot separate someone into their race, completely separate from their gender, completely separate from other things, disability, class, you know, socioeconomic class, gender identity, uh, sexuality, so on and so forth. And that's the opposite of what it is now where we're slicing and dicing people based on identity categories, or as I've taken to call them songs, social categories. Yeah. And not know, identity. Fun- yeah, and it's funny because like I had to ask you because we were talking about it, yeah. like you said, and I was like, so what is the original definition? And then you told me yeah. and I'm like, how how did we get so far well we got so far because there are there's a completely this is my take on it anyway of years of this crap Mm -hmm. Um, and the academic language is not intended to be used outside of the academy a word that has one meaning in popular parlance takes on a different meaning in, in different academic disciplines, I did a thing when I was in university where I deliberately picked courses that had the same book on the, the, the reading list so I didn't have to read as many books. <laughs> and it's amazing how different the approaches are from anthropology to humanities to, um, to, Eng- to literature. And then we get into the other issue with the way feminism is handled in academia. It's this, it's usually part of something called an interdisciplinary study, Uh which I, I am very unpopular because I completely disagree with the idea that we should be, we should be subdividing academic thought based on subject. And, and this was a way to get more, quote unquote, diversity into courses. So instead of being anthropology, sociology, literature, history, psychology, so, philosophy, so on and so forth, we have women's studies or gender studies or African-American studies or Latin American studies, so on and so forth. But that's going to lead to huge gaps in the understanding of the human experience. Yeah, and what it also and like, leads to is segregation. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. It suddenly be- your entire study is about this one segment without understanding another person's point of view. And like, this is something I talk about a lot where it's like, you need to be able to step back and see what someone el- where someone else is coming from and understanding what makes them tick because otherwise how can you have a good conversation about anything well it also does exactly what it was intended not to do in Mm -hmm. that the 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 subject matter Mm -hmm. is still the white anglo-saxon protestant straight cisgender male point of view so history is white and male and everything else gets subdivided into interdisciplinary studies, which are obviously not taken as seriously. Now, okay, I'm, I love history. I'm a big fan of history. I'll be the first one to admit you don't get very far with a history degree, <laughs> which sucks, but it's still true. And I mean, academia has become an issue because now that a college degree is required a lot of people go to go to university who don't really want to be there mm-hmm. as well. And so you get people taking what we used to call bird courses. Things that, you know, okay, you have to get a degree. 
And so people get a degree because they were told to get a degree. And what is what does that do for them now? Not much. It, so it leads bitter. to a whole lot of student debt. And, uh, you're right. It's it's less than worthless because now you've got a degree that it is it used to be okay you can get you know jobs in banking or jobs in you know working with people the basic idea this is insane to me the basic idea is you finished something but now it's not so now there's all these personality tests and all this stuff where a college degree unless you know what you're going to do with it isn't worth very much and that's left a lot of people really really feeling burned and that's legitimate and and this might be a bit of a hot take but i think it's also left people i'm trying to find the right words educated enough to feel they're superior i agree without having having anything to actually back it up yeah I mean, that was the interesting thing about my experience because I actually went in and tested uh, feminist theory in media (laughs) and a lot of it doesn't work. No. You know, that's that's where I realized, you know, hey, this whole male gaze theory thing. Yeah, it's hella racist. (laughs) It is so racist, like very, very racist. What is this? It's not. It's not the tastes of all men. It's the tastes of a select subcategory of men that I don't even believe is the majority. (laughs) And, you know, you start getting into that and then you're called woke. Yeah. And that's, I think the, it's really interesting because for the last, oh God, since around 1999, I've been watching the the various extreme factions just trade off on talking points so one side does something that seems to get them some attention not results attention attention and the other side starts doing it and then the side that originally did it cries foul when the other side does it and that's brought us to a form of advocacy that it seems to be working at complete cross purposes with its with its stated intents. Do you find that as well, or is this just my personal? No, I you know, do because like we talked last time about someone on the East Coast. Like I said, I don't remember if it was Virginia or Pennsylvania or what suing Barnes and Noble for a, yeah, book, a book that was on the young adult shelf. And I think yeah. th- there was two books involved in the lawsuit, but obviously yeah. A Court of Mist and Fury is the one I've read. So that was the one I paid attention right. to. And I agree, books need a new adult shelf, like I said. Yeah. But it's, it's you know, we've seen this stuff recently with like editing Roald Dahl's work and yeah. and other authors as well and, you know, the right cries foul. They're like, oh, no, how dare you? And I'm in the side where I'm like, look, even if the author wasn't a great person and had issues, it, it's his words. Leave them as they were and let the public decide whether this is worth preserving or not. I had a weird counter example to that. Mm-hmm. And it cracked me up precisely because I know where the right tends to land on works of fiction and so-called censorship Mm -hmm. because when I point out the amount of sex and violence in the Bible they say well that's why we have children's Bibles it's like oh so you're changing a book so that it's more quote-unquote appropriate for And let's face it, it's not about what kids want. It's about what modern parents feel comfortable with. And I just think it's interesting that every every combatant in in this whole culture war mess has a massive case of it's okay when we do it. Yes. And books, I mean, okay, there was all that stuff with the Hayes Code in Hollywood and, you know, a lot of the movie versions of classic books that got adapted 
they're heavily, heavily changed. Um, one of the big, well, not it's a big one, but one that stood out to me as a small change that just makes you go, huh? If you don't understand Hayes Code, mm -hmm. there is a 1940s Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. And it, they changed a bunch of stuff because Austin is really hard to adapt to a visual yeah. medium. Yeah. But one of the things they changed is Mr. Collins, who is an obnoxious clergyman mm -hmm. in the book. And it, it was Jane Austen making a point because she doesn't seem to like clergymen, despite I her father being why. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he was changed to a librarian. Yeah. Which it's yeah. funny, they but it's also didn't, they didn't want to touch it. Yeah, because. But how is that any different than race swapping a character today, right? They're trying to avoid offending people. Mm -hmm. it, it's the same impulse. And I think that that's important to recognize because when people start going on about editing media based on current fashion or current taste, it's not a new thing. Well, it's here, absolutely here's not a new thing. Here's my kind of kind of a counter to race swapping is especially in terms of what intersectionality has become saying, oh, people of different ethnicities and everything, they have a different experience. Mm -hmm. OK, then you can't. Yes, you there, can't it's say not, that it's not what we call fungible. Or yeah. Fungible. So it's yeah. like if you're if you're telling me this is a certain type of lived experience, then let's say Peter Parker, who grew up a working class white Irish kid, that's yeah. also a lived experience. And so if you're trying to say that you can race swap them without any changes, well, then you're invalidating your own argument. And, well, and I'd really like to see if somebody decided to remake Harry Potter and cast a brown kid to play Harry, what J.K. Rowling would think about that. I mean, she, she was she, oh, she was fine with Hermione suddenly. Oh, I didn't indicate her race. Bull. Yeah. Bull on that. I call bull. That was her being ironically politically correct. But, you know, the minute it hits an identity point, for people, people get upset because of course they do, because that same different part of the brain causes us intense pain when all of a sudden we have to completely renegotiate how we fit in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a real human driver that a lot of these, and, and I think it's interesting, we went big picture kind of activism to, to kick this off because well, I don't think we intended to do this, but it, I think it's no. right. Um, one thing, because I've been doing this a long damn time, <laughs> you have to recognize is there's a part of critical race theory. <gasps> I said it. That is actually very important that everybody understands when we talk about this stuff. And we never hear the actual theories of critical race theory because people think it's lived experience opinion writing and it's not mm -mm. one of the theories that is really important to understand about activism and social change comes from critical race theory and it's something called interest convergence you're not going to get change until the dominant group that is not necessarily majority but they're the ones that are in charge feels like there's something in it for them and that has always been true that's not a moral judgment that's just, you need majority consensus for politicians to get off their ass and change laws. It, that's, that's human nature. Right. It's the way the system works and it's the way the system will always work. And right now, feminist messaging has fucked up so badly oh, that God. abortion is majority popular. People don't have an issue with the right to an abortion. There's majority consensus that people think it's generally a good thing for society. Mm -hmm. But because of faffing around, the conservatives got a chance to stack the courts, what they've been working on. I mean, that has been the plan for at least 
more than 50 years started in it started in earnest in the 70s and they got it because they were willing to stick to something and everything else was like shut up stick to the plan that's how you win that is not what these various you know the various groups that generally are more right you know they have the right idea that different types of people need to feel included in society it's the execution of that that gets completely messed up and one of the things if you study the the history of feminism Uh an ongoing thing with this movement is they always exclude a critical group and then it gets torn apart from the inside it has happened in every wave in first wave they left out the working class in second wave they left out black women and lesbians actively lesbians in the third wave those fault lines are still active and now you've got trans women that are being left out and the concerns of latinas and so on and so forth and what's happening is slowly but surely more groups of women are pissed off at the organizing body than actually agree with the priorities i mean even even when they had the women's march on washington in 2017 if you look at the organization on that Mm -hmm. it was an absolute mess because it's like originally it was started by a white woman as i recall yeah she she was essentially bullied out to make way for a minority leader and then what was it they originally wanted to hold it at the well, lincoln two memorial of, two out of i the think or two out of the four organizers were active anti-semites and they swear up and down they're not but yeah. come on yeah. like don't piss in my ear and tell me it's raining yeah and oh god what was that one woman who like actively calls for sharia law oh uh linda and, sarsour yeah sarsour yeah and you know <laughs> she well, was there I mean, tamora pierce was a student of farrakhan it's messed up what's that uh louis farrakhan nation of islam there's actively an anti-semitic content mm-hmm. in in what in what they preach literally is preaching um that's not a pejorative in this case there's mm-hmm. a religious subtext to the whole thing yeah, yeah that's been an issue with Farrakhan from the beginning. He's one of the few leftists to get his accounts banned for hate speech. And like, I will say the one thing about the Women's March that extremely amused me was originally they wanted to hold it at like the Lincoln Memorial, yeah, whatever that's called. But by the time they put in for the permit to be there, someone else had already booked it and they yeah. threw a fit that oh, this is because we're women. No, it's because you it's weren't, yeah. you weren't prepared. <laughs> well, it was su- originally supposed to be a victory celebration for Hillary Clinton. That was premature. It, it became the issue with the women's March is an issue I have with, you, you may have seen me on social media saying to people, what is your ask? What are you actually looking to do here? What is I don't think past... I was following you at that point. Yeah. What is the pass fail condition for this piece of action? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, we've got 17 year olds who the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivors who know how to do this. So there's no excuse because they, you know, they want changes to gun laws. They they have certain asks, even, you know, the um, uh, Project Zero which is an offshoot of Black Lives Matter, they have specific asks. And as the data improves, as they find out what works, what doesn't work, they change the ask. They're constantly revising their policy recommendations. That's something you can test. That's something you can see how you're doing and see if you're actually making progress. That's not what a lot of these feminist groups do because that would involve having to compromise on something and the moral purity standards that they subject themselves to just don't allow for that. The minute, the minute you compromise on anything, you're a bad person and you're out of the collective. Uh-huh. And those movements, a house divided cannot stand. No. There's no way to get anything done 
when you boot someone out on the first thought crime. And that is, yeah. I mean, that goes back to the, the, the sex wars, the wars over porn in second wave feminism, the sex positive feminists. This is, this is one of the greatest stories of you were right the first time in, in history. The sex positive feminists didn't want to let sex negative feminists like Andrea Dworkin in to academic conferences because, you know, they thought their opinions lacked rigor and they thought they were disruptive. And they basically said, well, if we let them in, they'll take over and ruin the standards that we've built to actually have to prove your case. Uh -huh. And the sex negative feminists screamed and yelled and demanded to be included. We're being no, we're being deplatformed, yada, yada, yada. And sure enough, the minute they got in, they did exactly what their detractors said they'd do. They kicked out all the sex positive feminists in positions of authority and, you know, got a toehold in academia. And that's why feminist academia is so fucked up to this day. You know, recently I did a um, segment in a video on the fashion of Charmed. Yeah, we which... can we can, uh, we can um, give Bobby a shout out. Okay, yeah, we both contributed um... that video. Bobby, you're awesome. <laughs> yes, he really is. This channel so... better with Bob, I think it's called. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't even watch Charmed, and like I, I just love his videos. They're so wholesome. Charmed is a good show. Charmed. I was a Charmed fan more than I was a Buffy fan back in the day understandable because it just felt like there was more of a female voice involved but if, if you want it's 90 schlock but it's good 90 schlock yes. if you want to go back and watch charmed it still holds up pretty well yeah so since watching his videos i've been thinking i might have to do that yeah. but so the point was um so he just did a video basically talking about the historical context of the fashion and charm right and how it is e even as the network executives were like yeah we want more skin at the same time it was incorporated into the story in a way that reflects empowerment for the characters because the and, female actress has actually got a say in what they wore yes yeah. and but one of the comments was Yes, feminism has been saying this for years. That was, that's what the slut walks were about. Yeah. And I'm like, is that what they were about? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That, see, feminism has, okay. Feminism is too big. If you say, what does feminism want? There's no answer. Because no. it's women are half the population, more than half the population, because mm -hmm. men die by stupid at young ages. <laughs> that was not a dig on men. It's just, yes, the the preventable deaths among young men for various reasons are just higher than than women. And society was, for was, some odd reason doesn't want to do anything about that. I was watching a video responding to some red pillars who were basically saying, oh, women shouldn't be involved in decision making. And one of the comments, absolutely glorious, was Three words why women should always be involved in dis in decision making. Hey, watch this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Guys, and they actually find young men when they get into groups behave mm -hmm. exponentially more recklessly. And that's oh, not yeah. because there's anything wrong with men. I really believe that's purely socialization. Yes. Yeah. And like, I, I, I want to be clear that it's like most of my friends are guys. Like it, I, I understand guys better than I do women sometimes. But you understand it's really women better ironic. than I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that there's a reason for that. And we can get into that because again, half the population, mm -hmm. men, there's an expectation that men are individuals much more than women. Because, you know, if if you make choices that the collective doesn't agree with, you're bad for women. And that you can't do that with a full half of the population. There's too many variables to be able to say that with any certainty. But I don't see men getting that, though, because like at the beginning of June, an artist I follow on Instagram posted if you're one of the rare straight white guys who's actually decent, I'm sorry, but you're getting lumped in with all the bad ones until people actually change. And I'm like, congratulations, you've just pushed any decent white men 
into the arms of the extremists. Well, that's also psychologically wrong. Yeah. It's like because you have to reward the behavior you want to see. Exactly. You cannot. So that's why I say it's like I I see the same thing on both sides where it's like, oh, sorry, even if you're different, we're going to treat you the same. And it's like, but they're not the same. So why are you not encouraging the good behavior? Well, because 80 percent of everyone is stupid. I mean, (laughs) it's that 80 percent of everything is shit. That goes the same for protest movements. Oh, yeah. It just, and the problem is, again, you get into issues of identity, they're tender. And this message that anybody doesn't count is counter to equality. And I get people being exhausted. I think we're all exhausted. Everybody's (sighs) like, June was exhausting. Like, you know, I was, I was, well, I don't know. We all were like, you saw it song. The bunch of us were like, hey, happy pride when it started. And as the month went on, we're like, we're so tired. You know, like just so, it was so ugly it, this it's year. Not, like I barely even noticed pride aside from at the beginning of the month. Right. But like there was everyone I know just had so much going on in their lives. Yeah. And so many things happening that well because i think it's the one month now that anybody can do anything before the 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 temperature gets inhospitably hot yeah so everybody's cramming everything into june which isn't great but that's the reality of the planet right now yeah so it's it's been a busy month but it's also just been uh, let's face it the news has been really hard for a lot of people and you know everything is coming down to the supreme court and the reality is the court is gonna court until you know somebody drops dead or retires and the only way it's gonna become more liberal in its nature is if someone drops dead because if someone retires a conservative justice is going to do it with conservatives in government Mm-hmm. So, you know, unless unless uh, it, we go straight ticket Democrat three cycles in a row in the U.S., which never happens no. for either party. The last time it happened was Reagan with Bush and even B- Bush was a one termer. So this, you know, relying on legislation, re- relying on courts to solve problems <laughs> relying on forcing people to behave well it's not going to work like i'm in the middle enough that i don't necessarily want to see straight ticket democrat yeah because there's going to be other things that you yeah. know the the us system is not just is not designed to work that way and it's very unlikely that's going to happen anyway yeah no yeah, it's it, it just doesn't happen in American government. People, one, like divided government. Two, um, people get pissed off at one group and so they re- they they vote, they protest vote the other way. And then, you know, it's the reality of, well, the, the system is the way the system is. And we can scream and yell and complain about the way the system is all we want. The system is the system. And you have to decide whether you're going to work within the system or whether you're going to try to change the system. And yes, different groups of people can work at different things, but you got to be careful not to work at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into the nasty impossibility of answering the question, what women want. The Canterbury Tales answered that question way back in the day. And I think the most accurate way anybody has what women want is the ability to change her mind. Uh The, the, you know, that, that freedom because women are 50% of the population. And it's the ability to change her mind. And also 
to make our own decisions. Well, to have to have options. Yes. I think is what it comes down to when you're restricting various choices. Some people may be good. You're you're you know, you can't legislate morality. You can't mm-hmm. save somebody's soul through law. You can't because if it's not a choice, it's not a choice. That that's not virtue, that's oppression. And both sides try to do that when it when it comes to women. You know, you shouldn't be able to do that. You shouldn't be able to say something I I disagree with. You shouldn't be able to do something I disagree with. Well, that fundamentally misunderstands the idea of freedom. And it certainly misunderstands the idea of equality. Because if if you have fewer choices than the person next to you, that's not equal. Period, end of story. I mean, there's no way around that. And that's the thing I find a lot of these activist groups miss. And similarly to, you know, that that idea that men are judged by the bad ones. Um, women or certain types of women, women who are not traditional, are lumped in with the lunatics, even though the lunatics are the minority. And I mm-hmm. shouldn't even call them lunatics because they're not crazy. They may be sociopathic. <sighs> it, you know, they they may they may even have personality disorders. I mean, I think a lot of them are speaking from a point of pain. Well, everybody's speaking from a point of pain these days. That's true. But you look at, I mean, you look at some of the greatest writers of the second wave, not just Andrea Dworkin, but people like Shmuel Firestone or Sylvia Plath. They were, no joke, very mentally ill. And does that discount their perspective? Absolutely not. Because part of the the issue back then was the the boundary at which women were labeled crazy was lower than for men and that was important to talk about but you know Andrea Dworkin was delusional for at least part of her life that is not an insult literally she was seeing and hearing things that were not there and is that a reliable narrator for someone who's appeal was based on a story of the horrible things that happened to her that's fair to ask but the minute you go down that road it's like you hate women it's like no i don't first of all that's weird second of all i don't hate women i care very much about this working and so there have to be standards and the minute you start refusing to have standards you are going to lose because the reasonable person test applies. Anybody that looks at that and goes, that doesn't make sense, you're not going to win them over. It doesn't matter how right you are. If you're not making sense to someone, they may shut up, they may conform, but the first chance they get, they're going to rebel. And that's, you know, what's happening in a lot of cases. And Women's issues are difficult. And I know we, we haven't really gone granular yet, guys, but there's a lot of there's a lot of board to set on this stuff. Women's issues are difficult precisely because the group is so big. Uh-huh. But also historically, the imbalance is so profound and so woven into our idea of what is normal that even people who want to change it do fall prey to some of the bad stuff, for lack of a better term. You know, I mean, the one you've seen since the first wave is treating women like women are less accountable for our actions than men. And you see feminists leveraging that all the time. And I think that's bad. It's going in the opposite direction of where we need to go. Because accountability is, you know, bed buddies with equality. And nobody's going to buy 
that feminists really want equality if they're trying to if if people are watching them openly dodge accountability you know the whole amber heard thing is a shining example of that that was a Mm -hmm. shit show and the fact that it's over a year and they're still going on that it's like give me a break in an equal world there would be as many vociferous ongoing defenders of anthony rap saying that guy got a raw deal as there are amber heard i'm not sure if you're familiar with that with kevin spacey song a little yeah and the 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 fact that people aren't familiar with with it is part of the problem Mm -hmm. you know because anthony rap claims kevin spacey put him in we'll say inappropriate situations when he was a minor and by inappropriate exposing him to sexualized environments when he was below legal age and and that was that that was like a Joss Whedon in Hollywood Spacey mm-hmm. and it was was a, a known commodity regarding his taste for 15 year old boys and so I believe Anthony Rapp and the fact that that has just gone away because he's the wrong kind of victim. Okay. That's a problem. So, here's the thing with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Mm-hmm. It became a battleground for both sides of the Me Too issue. Yeah. And before Johnny Depp, there was vic mignonia who yeah is lesser known but he's... another one i personally saw behaving inappropriately so i have a bias on that one okay here's the thing i remember years before years before me too happened i was watching a con vlog from a cosplayer i followed mm-hmm. and she mentioned being in the pool And she heard something, looked over, and saw a couple younger women, Mm -hmm. so probably in their teens, and he, Vic Mignogia was with them. And she's like, isn't that that voice actor guy? And she didn't say much about it besides she was like, yeah, that doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And like, this was back in like 2011, 2012. So this was way before pop feminism had taken off this was way before me too and so when the whole thing came out i saw a lot of people particularly people i knew from comics and again i was on the early comics gate Mm -hmm. side before it went totally crazy i saw a lot of people who were doing the i stand with vic Mm -hmm. and i'm like ah mm, you might want to be careful with that one now do you think these were good people who just got caught up i do okay i think it's people who they they didn't like see i want to say they were good people i'm sure there are some who weren't so good but at the same time i know a lot of guys were scared by me too right and not even bad guys just they saw they were intimidated let me attempt this there is Mm -hmm. something inherently unnerving in the idea that an accusation is all it takes there's no investigation there's no um a chance to defend yourself there's no ability to present evidence it's if she says you did it you did it that was the problem and yeah and that's what i never liked about it either and so, but, you know, I started seeing the I stand with Vic hashtag and I'm like, I'm, I'm not touching that one. Cause like yeah. I said, I've heard yeah. context. Yeah. Here's, That's it's very hearsay. similar to, yeah. to what I saw. Yeah. 